Welcome to St. Joseph Evangelization Network, SJEN.TV. My name is Peter Karutz and I have the great honor of being here at the 20th anniversary of the Marian Conference here in St. Louis with Cardinal Burke. Cardinal, thank you so much for being here I'm today. pleased to be with you. And um, Cardinal, we, we know you. You were our Archbishop for some period of time. And um, I, I know you know so many people here in, uh, in the Archdiocese. I was very blessed to be in the Archdiocese, and I, I continue to miss it, to be honest with you. Well, we miss you. <laughs> well, thank you. We miss you. And, and uh, just as a, on a personal note, my, my pastor for years is now a bishop. It's a Bishop Herman. Oh, yes. And, and when I see him, I, I, I'm uh, so disrespectful because I slip into calling him father. You know, <laughs> yes. I, I know he's a bishop, but I, I well, should respect his office, and I do. But, you know, when I think of you, uh, Cardinal, I, uh, your eminence, I, I think of you as a, a cardinal, of course, and an a archbishop. But fundamentally, you know, in my heart, you, you're a priest. Well, we all are priests, and I always say that father was the most beautiful title that I ever had, so I never am bothered when someone calls me father. Uh, in 1975, you were ordained. Uh, That's right, yes. The day I graduated from grade school, and well, so you've been at it a long, long time. It's been a while. It seems like it all went so very quickly, but this year I'll be 44 years a priest. And, and if I'm not mistaken, 24 years a bishop. That's correct, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Saint, uh, Pope St. John Paul ordained you. What a great honor. Yes, that January 6, 1995. Yes. So I, I have your new book. Uh, it's uh, Hope for the World. Uh, and, and as I, I haven't read it yet, but I, I have it in my hands now, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I, I think of where we're at today in the church. Um, is it time to evangelize? Yes, it's, uh, it's long past time and we, we need to, and there has been evangelization taking place, but we, we need to ramp it up, as they say, we, we, we need to, uh, desperately to return to the foundations of our Catholic faith, to know them deeply, and to give strong witness to them, courageous witness to them in a world which has become completely secularized. St. John Paul II said, uh, a world which lives as if God did not exist. Right. And so we, we have to, by our way of life, show the world that there is no other answer to the the many challenges of life in the world other than Jesus Christ and to, to live in Jesus Christ as he comes to us in his holy church. Right, and we're here at a Marian conference and we know that Our Lady is the heart of the church. We, our, our Lady is the, is the mother of God. It was through her that our Lord Jesus Christ came to us. It was conceived in her immaculate womb. God prepared her from all time by the Immaculate Conception to be the worthy uh, vessel in which he would send his only begotten son into the world. She gave birth to him at Bethlehem. We've just been celebrating that in the Christmas season. And then as he was dying on the cross, he gave her to us as our mother and signified that she would continue to be the mother of divine grace. And so she is our great intercessor. She's the one who leads us. Uh, to Christ, who alone is our salvation. Uh, the, uh, the key uh, to understanding this is the wedding feast at Cana. Here we have the last recorded words of the Blessed Mother when she takes the wine stewards to Christ in their great distress over not having sufficient wine for the wedding guests. She takes them to, to Christ, who is also a guest with his mother at this wedding feast, and she says, do whatever he tells you. And those words have become for us the program of our lives, to do whatever Christ tells us, and that's our Blessed Mother who guides us and protects us to, to be true sons and daughters of, of God in his only begotten Son. Our, 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 truly, Our Lady has walked with our Lord throughout his life from beginning until literally the end. And what did she say? She pointed to him in, in every way, pointed yes. to him. Yes. Uh, uh, Your Eminence, I'd like to move more toward your book and yes. what do we need to do? I, I know that when I, I go to our cathedral or in the cathedral in Rome, over the altar I see a canopy and that's the marriage canopy. So I look to, a, I'm a man, I look to us men. How do we evangelize? Let me put a question to you, if I may. 
of the faithful. We need to evangelize, let me say first, to our, our, our brothers and sisters who have fallen away, maybe those who have run away. How do we reach out? How do we reach out to our brothers and sisters who have run away from the church? The, I think the only way is to, first of all, live very strongly our Catholic faith, especially a life of prayer, uh, of fidelity to the sacraments, regular confession, of course, participation in Sunday Mass and as often as possible also in daily Mass, and then the witness of a, of a real Christian life. This is what attracts people above all, and, and people don't uh, fail to, to see in someone uh, a deep love of Christ as it's manifested in so many natural ways. We don't put on a show. We simply, by the way we speak and act, it's clear that Christ is alive in us. And that is perhaps the best way to, to reach those who have gone away from the church. Uh, also, I think it's important to, to speak with them uh, about why they've left the church, what, what, what hurt have they experienced, or what challenge in their lives led them to, to this decision. Try to help them ourselves, but also to put them in contact with a good priest who could, uh, uh, who will listen to their story and help them to understand what has happened in their lives. I spoke with an old classmate of mine uh, just recently, and, and that's what he said, you know, it's the hurt that has driven him away. So the first thing I said is, I'm sorry. Yes, I mean, we all should be deeply sorry for the scandals in the church. And right now in our country, we have experienced a terrible scandal. Uh, and we, uh, this summer when the scandal broke and I happened to be visiting in the States, many people opened their hearts to me and their, and their, the deep anger in them, the deep sense of betrayal. And uh, I said this to, uh, friends of mine when I was in Rome and they said what did you say to them and I said I said to them that I'm sorry that uh, I uh, feel the hurt as deeply as they do and that they're the only thing we can all be is sad that that the the beauty of the church and that beauty is unchanging because Christ is alive in his church that that beauty has been so uh, clouded over, uh, so besmirched by, by sinful men, and, and we need to, to make reparation for that and, uh, and to pray very much for the church that she can once be purified of, these, of this corruption. Yeah. I want to go back to your advice, but let me just add, add to that. I think the other emotion we feel, and I, I looked at my daughter when we had to talk about this terrible conversations they have, she's heartbroken. I yeah. mean, that, that's the only, the only word I can put to it absolutely heartbroken you know here's someone someone the church some that she loves and she's heartbroken yes. so we have to deal with a broken heart in, in maybe a, in, in a in a gentle way yes no above all with uh, with understanding and with comprehension and with gentleness uh, but also uh, expressing the firm faith we have that our Lord never abandons his church That's right. and that our Blessed Mother uh, never ceases in, in her maternal love to care for the church. We, we have to, uh, we, we must in some way f express that too to those who are hurting so much. I cannot tell you how many times my Protestant brothers and sisters have invited me to go to their church. And, and you know what they tell me? They say, you will hear scripture and the gospel and I say, how about coming to my church where the totality of the Mass is Scripture and That's gospel? right. That's right. Uh, the, we hear also in every Mass, we hear the Word of God proclaimed to us, the Holy Scriptures. But then we see those Scriptures fulfilled right before our eyes mm. in the great mystery of faith, in the, in the mystery of the Holy Eucharist, Christ descending from his throne at the right hand of the Father and making sacramentally present the, his sacrifice in Calvary and the great fruit of that sacrifice, his body, blood, soul, and divinity as the bread of eternal life. So this, in fact, uh, it's interesting you mention that, but the, the great convert to the Catholic faith, Scott Hahn, tells mm -hmm. a story about how he went to a mass on the campus of Marquette University, Shock. Milwaukee, 
intending to go there to to make a, a refutation of the Catholic faith. <laughs> he, he heard the scriptures, and then as the mass continued, all of a sudden his eyes were opened and he said, I, I saw that those very words of scripture were now being fulfilled, and that a bit was the beginning of his conversion. I read the same book and he was shocked, not only at that, that, that blew him away, that was yes. the, the, the final stroke, but throughout he says, that scripture, that scripture, that scripture, I thought these Catholics never saw scripture. Mm -hmm. I, I heard him speak not too long ago at uh, the summit for Legatus, and he and Steve Woods, I don't know if you're familiar oh, I with I know, them. yes. What, but they both, it, well, Scott Hahn quoted the same statistics that Steve Wood did. He said this, this is where I'm trying to concentrate on how you can direct us men to be better. He said, fathers who have no faith, probability, and I'll get the numbers slightly wrong, fathers who have no faith, 85% of their children will not have a faith throughout their life. Fathers who lead their families, 85% of their children will stay in the faith, faith for their entire life. Help us be better fathers. Yes, this is the, the great uh, uh, tragedy of our time was the, the diminution of respect for fatherhood and also a, a kind of sidelining of men in general in society and especially of fathers. And there's no question that God the Father from the moment of creation uh, intended uh, fathers to be the great transmitters of the faith. Yes, the mothers too, but the father has a very particular role as the head of the household. And if he's either absent or if he's present but has no faith and gives no leadership in his family with regard to the faith, it will be very difficult that the children will be able to, to deepen their own faith, which they receive at baptism, and, and themselves remain faithful to Christ. And so we need, in a very strong way, to, to reach out to men and to uh, help them to understand well, what it means to be a man and especially the importance of their manhood for the work of evangelization, especially in the family, but also in, in all walks of, of life that uh, where good Christian men can give a strong and, uh, and efficacious witness uh, to Christ. And thanks be to God for many years now, uh, certainly all of my years as a bishop, uh, uh, there have been good men move, uh, movements for men, conferences, retreats, and encouragement. But we need to do much more because we've lost so much ground over the past decades in this regard. And um, there's an interesting book by a very fine Catholic psychologist, Paul Witz, but he calls uh, uh, atheism, he said, is the religion of the fatherless. People who who don't experience a father in their own lives have a very difficult time to believe in God the Father. And, uh, and so we, we need to, to take that very much to heart and, and fathers in particular uh, need to just witness to their children in their own way. You don't have to be eloquent. You, you don't have to be fancy or anything else. You simply need to have a strong faith in God and communicate it to your children. Let me continue on with that. We at, at our parish, we have a, and I don't think you know him because he's kind of a young priest. Our new pastor, Father Schroeder, Schrader, he he's encouraged us to start a "This Man Is You," and we we got about 175 men to sign up, and half of them are young fathers. And after a, a few weeks, I'll say this: their hearts needed this. They they really needed it. They 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 need the camaraderie. Your Excellency, us men don't always um, do good things when we're yes, together. I know. But this is a great thing. The fellowship of good men with a good purpose. As you're saying, a program maybe encourage, and we need to invite men to maybe join a men's group. Yes, well, I think I may know Father Schrader because he was in the seminary when I was Archbishop of St. Louis and oh, uh, well he's we, done well yes we well he I'm not surprised he was <laughs> he was an excellent seminarian and uh, and I'm very happy to hear that about him uh, yes it's true uh, if and this is the question of of the company one keeps <laughs> if you as men we need to to 
make friendships with men who lead us to become more of who we, God has called us to be, and not men who drag us down into uh, what the saying goes to, to misery. Misery loves company. People right. who, are, who are unhappy tend to want to draw others into that unhappiness. No, we need to, to bond, and that's the wonderful thing about uh, uh, an apostle like the one you just mentioned is that it, it awakens in men that natural chivalry, if I may say, or idealism in a man to be heroic and to, to make sacrifices for his family and above, and above all for his faith. So I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about that. And I'm, I'm sure that these young uh, husbands and fathers will be fortified in a challenging vocation today. Uh, Colonel, can you give us some advice? If, if we are perhaps not booming and blooming in our spirituality, where's our first step? And you, in, in your book, you, you say, you're looking, quite frankly, to change the world, spiritual renewal. Yes. Where is our first step? Today, I'm going to do this, or today I would encourage another man or woman to do this. Yes. What would that be? The, the first uh, step is, is twofold. Uh, number one, I need to come to know Christ better. And what does that mean? I need to know my Catholic faith better. And secondly, I need to, knowing Christ, I need to love him. And, and we love him by meeting him in the sacrament of confession, by receiving him in Holy Communion, and then by a life of daily prayer. Uh, each That prayer suited to the responsibilities that one has, but all of us should have a, a pattern in our daily life of prayer in the morning, prayer in the evening, and prayer at times during the day. And then those, this is the way in which we communicate with God and he communicates with us and he, he strengthens us uh, in the faith, draws us closer to himself and we become stronger. No one should be discouraged uh, because uh, uh, our Lord himself said, if your faith was as small as a mustard seed, uh, it can grow into the mightiest plant and be a, a, a shelter for the birds and so forth. In other words, even if your faith is very small, uh, if you nourish it at the fountains of salvation, especially the sacraments, the life of prayer, it will grow stronger. The internet can be a great thing. Yes. Right. And I, I was, uh, I remember I was in Europe traveling and I had a, lot, a little bit of time on my hands and I found a series of videos from Cardinal Arinza. Oh yes, and he uh, you made me think of that. What what a man a man as you who really knows the faith intimately, but he he also communicates that so well, honestly, even the tough parts, which I think is what you're doing here. Yes, got to talk about those. Yes, things. we have to. We can't uh, make out the faith to be some kind of uh, cakewalk or. Or, or some kind of unrealistic uh, answer to the to the situation of our lives and of our world. No, the faith is is first and foremost completely realistic. All we have to do is look at the gospel, uh, the realism of what Christ faced in carrying out his right. public ministry and ended in his cruel passion and death. So all of us, we need to be realistic about what our own personal lives demand, what our the situation of our world demands, and then go after it and be as uh, confident as we should be that our Lord will not fail to bring to fruition any good that we do. St. Paul at the end of his, his life and he was looking back over everything and of course he suffered many setbacks and even betrayals among those he had uh, evangelized. But he, his final comment to St. Timothy was writing to him uh, he said, I've fought the good fight, I've stayed the course, I've kept the faith. And that's all any of us should be concerned about, that when we meet our Lord, we can say to him, I've fought the good fight, I've stayed the course, I've kept the faith. To and, the end. To the end. And we all, everything we do is in view of eternal life. That's one of the difficulties of today in society, is people are living for the moment. And when you live for the moment, you, you can do very destructive things, both of yourself and of others, and we need to have the perspective of eternity. 
maybe an encouragement for marriage. Um, I, I, I know that uh, our Lord did gave us some promises. One of the things he promised us was our own crosses. Yes. And uh, some, sometimes I've heard uh, some folks say that maybe our crosses are something that our Lord designed specifically for us, for us to improve. In, in marriage today, uh, I'm sure you'll know many people say, well, I'm not happy. I don't remember a promise of eternal happiness uh, in the marriage vows myself. Mm. But how do we encourage married folks to, as you say, persevere, to embrace their cross? I think that in our society, we're very much influenced by the notion that everything should be convenient and easy. There should be uh, uh, something for every problem in life, some easy solution. And the fact of the matter is that the solution is uh, to all of life's questions is our complete engagement in, in life. And in marriage, as it so is said in the marriage, in the exchange of vows, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. And uh, that's uh, the only thing that should matter for a married person is that he or she is giving uh, himself or herself completely and totally to the other. Also during periods of time which there seems, seems to be very little uh, personal gratification or satisfaction. But our life, we weren't made to, to be gratified, to be satisfied. We're, we're made to sacrifice ourselves and when we do that, we do have a deep interior joy that comes to us. All of us have our faults and failings. Uh, all of us can accuse ourselves of, of not having been everything we should have been either in the married life or in the priesthood. But the important thing is that we're striving uh, every day to turn to Christ and to live more fully our vocation. And then we're happy even in the midst of great suffering. You, you mentioned Paul persevering, fought the good fight, etc. Steve Woods, another, uh, you mentioned, you, you remember him or know him? Yes. He, he said that um, folks who have a terrible marriage, if they self-proclaim their marriage as ended terrible, you know, if they only stayed married for another five years, most of them will say, I have a beautiful marriage. Yes. Sometimes it's just the perseverance. Sure it is. Well, every, in every vocation, there are periods of time that are, are difficult. You've had uh, difficulties? Oh, surely, <laughs> discouragements. And uh, we, if, we, if you give up at the first difficulty, then you, you'll never find the happiness that's intended. But he, he's quite correct. If, if people persevere, and I know so many wonderful couples who have gone through difficult times, but they've persevered and, and they find uh, uh, their happiness in that perseverance. I also know couples and individuals, I should say, who have been abandoned by a spouse, sure. but they're fully uh, convinced of the, of the marriage that's been betrayed in some way, who are living the rest of their life for that spouse, praying for his or her eternal salvation and, and living in fidelity to that marriage vow. And in that they find their happiness. It's not easy. And there is a lot of suffering involved, but they, they, they're growing closer to Christ and therefore they have a deep interior happiness. And, and quite frankly, that's my situation. Huh. My, my parents were divorced. My mother and father actually lived as married people separated for the rest of their life. There's value in suffering. Oh, of course there is, and the, it can be indeed and often is heroic. So what, what would be your final word for us the, the, to go out into the world to, to at, at this time? Some people say, uh, Cardinal, that at this point we ought to be quiet. I don't think so. No, I, I think no, it is no. time to change the world. Yes. Uh, What's your final word to have uh, the, us send us forth <laughs> to go and change this world? Uh, the final word is that Christ is alive in the church. He, he, he died, he rose from the dead, he's seated at the right hand of the Father in order to pour forth his Holy Spirit into our hearts. And no matter what scandals are taking place in the church, no matter what difficulties we face in our personal life, I, I urge you to turn to Christ, turn to the, His Holy Spirit dwelling in your heart. Unite your heart more completely with His Sacred Heart, which means accepting suffering in order to be pure and selfless in love. And you will be, uh, not only you will find peace and uh, happiness in your own life, but you will be a great gift to others. And, and the, the world is crying out 
for this witness. The world is crying out to know Christ and we all have to uh, understand that we are his ambassadors. We are his soldiers in the world. So let's not give way to discouragement, but let's be strong and courageous. Let us go to our Lord seeking this, 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 the source of our strength and courage and then give a strong witness to him. God bless you. Your Eminence, you've been a great blessing to St. Joseph Evangelization Network. You've been a great blessing to the St. Louis city, and you still are to the world. Well, we are so grateful. Well, thank you very much, and please pray for me. I will. Mm. Would you give us your final blessing? Yes, of course. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>